Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr. Gerin. Today we're going to investigate time, how we measure it and how we use it. We'll also work through some example questions of the kind you might see in the GCSE exam. Here you can see the 15th century astronomical clock in Prague, which tracks many of the things we'll talk about today. We all know how to tell the time. Clocks with dials or digital numbers are everywhere. Young children learn how to use them, since knowing the time is crucial in modern life and we've been using the concept of days and years for thousands of years. But it turns out time is a lot more complicated than just four numbers on a digital display. Physicists spend huge amounts on incredibly accurate atomic clocks, and astronomers use sophisticated observations of distant radio sources to determine how long a year is. Every now and then, to keep our clocks useful and accurate, we add one second to the length of a year. Today, we're going to use the sun to tell time. The principles we'll discuss are very old and have been in use for centuries or millennia. Sunrise and sunset are the easiest times to tell. Halfway between these is noon or midday. More precisely, noon is when the sun is at its highest point in the sky, its highest altitude or culmination. At this moment, for northern locations, the sun will be at an azimuth of 180 degrees, directly south. This will be important shortly. Traditionally, we call noon 12 o'clock. This was fine when we lived in small communities, and long-distance travel was rare. However, the sun appears at different positions for people at different locations on Earth. When it's noon for you, it's not noon at other longitudes, east or west of you. This started to be a problem with trains. You could go somewhere where the local time was several minutes different from what your watch said, and miss your return train. At first, railway stations had sundials to tell you what local time was, and a table of adjustments to find the time in destination towns. But this was complicated, and in 1840, Great Western Railway decided to just synchronise all their clocks, even though it meant they disagree with sundials. If only it were that simple. But timekeeping is more complex, and we'll turn now to the analemma. As discussed, at noon, the sun is at an azimuth of 180 degrees. The Earth's axis is tilted, so the sun's altitude at noon varies from day to day. It moves up and down, but not left or right. However, noon and 12 o'clock are not exactly the same thing. If we look at the sun every 24 hours, its azimuth and altitude both change throughout the year. Here we can see a plot of the sun's position at 12 o'clock every day. This plot shows the analemma, a shape that looks like a figure 8. The analemma is not symmetrical, as you can see if we expand the azimuth axis. So what does the analemma mean for telling the time? When the sun is at azimuth 180 degrees, it's at culmination, the highest altitude that day, and it is noon. But as the analemma shows us, at 12 o'clock, the sun is usually not at 180 degrees. We call the position of the sun in the sky the apparent sun. This gives us apparent solar time. For instance, if the sun is at azimuth 180 degrees, the apparent solar time is 12.00. We usually shorten this to AST, and AST is what sundials show us. We'll talk about what this means in a bit. First, let's look at how sundials work. Basically, a sundial is a stick in the ground. The sun makes the stick cast a shadow, at different directions depending on the time of day. This stick is called a gnomon. But this doesn't tell us the time. We need the second part of the sundial, the dial, a disc marked with times. As the sun moves across the sky, the gnomon's shadow falls on different parts of the dial, and the markings under the shadow tell us the time. The picture here shows that it's just before 1pm. Of course, Sundials need to be oriented correctly. This one has compass directions to help with that. They also need to be made for your specific latitude. If you move much to the north or south, you'll need a different sundial. You can find the time of local noon with just the gnomon, a shadow stick. Any stick will do, but the straighter the stick, the better. You'll also need a ruler or tape measure to measure the length of the shadow, and a correctly set clock, such as a smartphone. The clock will tell you when 12 o'clock is, but not when noon is. Put the stick vertically in the ground. 
try to do this on a level surface. If you're at school, you may be able to borrow a clamp stand to make this easier. Start your experiment before when you think noon is. Around 11.30 works in the UK. Every minute, measure and record the length of the stick's shadow. Don't worry if you have a few missing measurements, say because of clouds. You'll generally be able to measure to the nearest centimetre or half centimetre. The shadow's length will decrease for a bit and then start to increase. After it has increased for about 10 minutes, you're done. Now, plot a graph of your results and draw a line of best fit. Local noon is when the graph reaches its lowest point. In this graph, we can see that local noon is around 1212. 12. You can determine local noon just from a table of results, but the graph makes it easier. Now here is where things start to get a little more complicated. We can find apparent solar time using a sundial, but as we've seen with the analemma, the time between noon today and noon tomorrow, 12.00 AST today and 12.00 AST tomorrow, is not exactly 24 hours. This means that if you use the apparent sun to determine time, each day will have a different length. And indeed, this was the case for most of human history, although astronomers have had better timekeeping than most people needed for thousands of years. To make each day the same length, exactly 24 hours, we use mean solar time, MST. This uses the mean sun. At a certain time of day, the average, or mean, azimuth of the sun, averaged over a year, is 180 degrees. We call this time 1200 MST, and calculate MST based on this. The MST where you are, and at any other point at the same longitude, is called local mean time, LMT. LMT at longitude 0 degrees, which is defined as the longitude of Greenwich Observatory in England, is called Greenwich Mean Time, GMT. GMT is also called Universal Time, UT. Astronomers determine observation times in UT, with adjustments when necessary for local time. I recommend you make notes on each of these definitions, as you'll need to refer to these to understand the rest of this video. You can pause now and make your own notes, or print out the summary screen at the end of the video or on the Google Slides presentation linked in the description. So, as we've just seen, there's a difference between apparent solar time and mean solar time. We need to be able to convert between them. We can measure the sun's azimuth at 1200 MST and find out how much it differs from 180 degrees. If we convert this angle in degrees into time in minutes by multiplying by 4, we find the difference between AST and MST. We call this difference the equation of time. So we can convert between AST and MST using the formula equation of time equals AST minus MST. This formula is given to you in the GCSE exam, so you don't have to memorize it. The magnitude of the equation of time varies throughout the year and is usually written as a table or a graph like this one. You can see here, for example, that on the 1st of May, the equation of time is about plus 5 minutes. The graph does change very, very slowly, but this one will be accurate enough for many years. Now it's time to practice the conversion. You're going to calculate MST from AST. You'll need to find the equation of time at the correct date from the graph, and then calculate MST. Our sundial shows the time in AST. First, 11.30 on the 1st of September. Second, 13.10 on the 15th of May. And finally, 14.57 on the 1st of February. Pause the video while you figure out your answers. On the 1st of September, the equation of time is zero. We need to rearrange the formula to MST equals AST minus EOT, which is short for equation of time. So, MST equals 11.30 minus 0, or just 11.30. On the 15th of May, the equation of time is plus 6 minutes. MST is 13.10 minus 6 minutes, or 13.04. And on the 1st of February, the equation of time is minus 14 minutes. MST is 14.57 minus negative 14 minutes, 
or 1457 plus 14 minutes, which is 1511. The equation of time, which is very closely linked to the analemma, lets us have days of equal length. But why do we need it? Why isn't noon at the same time every day, 24 hours apart? There are two main effects to consider, eccentricity and obliquity. The Earth's orbit is eccentric, or elliptical. When the Earth is close to the Sun, it moves faster in its orbit than when it's further away, as Kepler observed. This means that the difference between the sidereal day and synodic day is not the same throughout the year. We'll discuss these two terms in a moment. And the Earth has obliquity. This means its rotation is tilted relative to its orbit, or inclined to the ecliptic. The effect is that at the solstices, the Sun seems to speed up, and at the equinoxes, it seems to slow down. You can see these effects in the animation on the right. I mentioned sidereal and synodic days. The synodic day is what almost everybody means when they say day. It's a period of 24 hours, and we can count the time from 12.00 MST today to 12.00 MST tomorrow. It's the time taken for the mean sun to reach the same position in the sky, or at least the same azimuth. For this reason, it's also called the solar day. And you might remember this more easily if you mispronounce synodic as sunodic. The sidereal day is the time for the Earth to rotate once on its axis, exactly 360 degrees. This is slightly less, four minutes less, than 24 hours, or about 23 hours, 56 minutes. To understand why, look at the diagram. Imagine that you're standing on the Earth at position 1, looking up at the Sun, which is at azimuth 180 degrees. You wait for the Earth to rotate exactly once, expecting the Sun to again be at azimuth 180 degrees. But the Earth has moved on in its orbit and is at position 2. You're not looking at the Sun now, which is at only 179 degrees. You have to wait for the Earth to turn one more degree which takes four minutes, position three. We can measure the synodic, or sunodic, day easily, using the sun. To measure the sidereal day, we use something much further away. Sidereal means of the stars, and we used to use distant stars. Now we use even more distant galaxies. Sidereal and synodic days can be tracked using sidereal and synodic time. Synodic time is what you're used to, and what your watch says. Sidereal time is a bit more complicated. At the vernal equinox, around 21st of March, sidereal and synodic time are the same, but 24 hours of sidereal time elapses for every 23 hours and 56 minutes of synodic time. As the year progresses, sidereal and synodic time get out of sync, and there's one extra sidereal day per year. You can actually buy watches and clocks set to sidereal time. But it's much easier to simply remember this. Sidereal time is the right ascension of any star on your meridian. See the celestial coordinates video for the meanings of these terms. We've talked about how the sun moves through the sky over a year. Now, let's have a look at its motion over one day. We all know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. At latitudes more than 23.5 degrees from the equator, it appears due south at noon in the northern hemisphere or due north at noon in the south. Within the tropics, it appears due north or due south at noon, at different times in the year. Here, we're going to consider the sun's motion from 52 degrees north, roughly the latitude of Greenwich. At the spring equinox, the sun rises exactly in the east. It moves from east to west, and sets exactly west. At noon, the sun rises to an altitude of 90 degrees minus your latitude. At a latitude of 52 degrees, the sun reaches 38 degrees. If we were on the equator, the sun would be directly overhead at noon, at 90 degrees altitude, also called zenith. At the summer solstice, however, the sun rises further north, in the northeast. Again, it moves from east to west, but now it sets in the northwest. Now it reaches an altitude at noon of 90 degrees minus your latitude plus 23.5 degrees, the inclination of the Earth. From our 52 degrees latitude, 
the sun reaches 61.5 degrees, and at the equator, the sun rises to 23.5 degrees north of your zenith, in other words, 66.5 degrees due north. The autumn equinox sees the sun move in the same way as it does on the spring equinox. It rises exactly east, reaches an altitude of 90 degrees minus your latitude, 38 degrees in this case, and sets directly west. Again, from the equator, the sun is directly overhead at noon. And lastly, the winter solstice. This time the sun rises in the southeast and sets in the southwest. At noon, it reaches an altitude of 90 degrees minus your latitude minus 23.5 degrees, rather than plus 23.5 degrees at the summer solstice. From 52 degrees north, that's a very low altitude of just 14.5 degrees, and at noon on the equator, it will reach 23.5 degrees south of your zenith, or 66.5 degrees due south. Here you can see all four paths together. The equinoxes show virtually identical paths. This picture would be different at different latitudes. At 52 degrees south, however, it would be the same, except that the cardinal points in red would read west north east, and the sun would move from right to left. The sun appears to take a different path on different days, but it's actually the same path through the sky each day. We don't see all of the path, as the sun can't be seen at night, and the Earth's tilt lets us see different parts of the path at different times of year. The sun crosses the line labelled east, azimuth 90 degrees, at 6.00 AST. Twelve hours later, it crosses the west line, azimuth 270 degrees, at 18.00 AST. This isn't quite correct, but it's close enough for today. And knowing this, we can see why daytime is longer in the summer and nighttime is longer in the winter. At equinox, which means equal night, day and night are both 12 hours, and half of the sun's path is above the ground. The shape of the path is always the same, but in the summer more of it is above ground, and in the winter more of it is below ground. Our last topic for today is how longitude affects time. I'll give you some explanations, and then you can practice some simple calculations. Longitude measures how far east or west you are from the prime meridian, or Greenwich meridian, in degrees. Sometimes it's given as positive for east and negative for west. We'll just say east or west today. The maximum longitude is 180 degrees in either direction, for a total of 360 degrees around the world. For historic reasons, we view the North Pole as the top of the world. Viewed from above the North Pole, the Earth turns anti-clockwise. A synodic day is 24 hours, or 1,440 minutes. This is 4 times 360, which means that any point on the Earth's surface turns 1 degree to the east every 4 minutes. This is an important fact to remember. 1 degree is equivalent to 4 minutes. This will come up a lot. If it's noon where you are, it's also noon at every point on the same longitude. In four minutes, it will be noon one degree west of you. And in an hour, 60 minutes, it will be noon 60 divided by 4 equals 15 degrees west of you. We say that America, to the west of Europe, is behind Europe. That means it's earlier in the day in America than it is in Europe. Asia, to the east, is ahead of Europe. For instance, when it's noon in London, it's 7.00 morning in New York, and 21.00 evening in Tokyo. The stars don't care what time we say it is, they're in the same position in the sky for all of us. But while that bit of the sky is above us, it's below people on the other side of the world, and there's a planet blocking their view. If you'd like extra practice with longitude calculations, see the Celestial Coordinates video at timestamp 2621. So, Time, as measured by the sun, varies as you go east or west. This became a problem with the invention of railways, and in 1840, Great Western Railway adopted railway time, setting all their clocks across England to the same time. In 1880, the British government officially adopted Greenwich Mean Time for the whole country, with the rest of the world gradually following. A region that has the same official time 
is called a time zone. These days, almost everywhere in the world has a time zone equal to GMT plus or minus a whole number of hours. If we divided the Earth into 24 equal time zones, each time zone would be 15 degrees wide. But, of course, politics and the shapes of countries don't fit this rule, giving us some oddly shaped time zone boundaries. Some countries extend across a wide longitude and adopt several time zones, such as the four time zones of the main part of the USA, or even Russia's 11 time zones. China extends over what should be five time zones, but it uses the same time throughout. The sun rises more than four hours earlier in eastern China than in western China. And if that wasn't complicated enough, many countries use daylight saving time. Some countries change their clocks in summer to be an hour ahead. This gives you more light in the evenings, but less night in the mornings, and it annoys astronomers. At Greenwich, when the mean sun is on the meridian in the winter, the clocks say 12.00, as you'd expect. But when the mean sun is on the meridian in the summer, the clocks say 13.00. In the summer, afternoon doesn't start until an hour later than the clocks indicate. The dates for daylight saving time are a political decision, and not based in astronomy. Here, we can see the normal analemma, at 12.00 GMT, compared with an analemma produced using 12.00 clock time at Greenwich, 12.00 GMT in the winter, and 12.00 BST, British summer time, in the summer. Note the slant of the summer portion of the analemma. We can create an analemma at any time of the day, and if we do so at a time other than 12.00 local mean time, the shape is different. BST is calculated as GMT plus one hour. You should be able to use the ideas we've discussed today to calculate and convert different times, and for the rest of this video we'll work through some example calculations. The maths needed is very simple, you just need to remember the methods, and there's a summary screen of the formula used at the end of this video, and on the linked Google Slides presentation. The equation of time formula is given in the GCSE exam, but you'll need to learn the rest. Astronomers generally work in universal time, which is the same as GMT, and needs to convert between UT and local time. Suppose you've measured apparent solar time, and needs to find out UT. You'll also need to know your longitude and the current equation of time. Find your AST, and subtract the equation of time to get MST. Then, multiply your longitude by 4. If your longitude is east, subtract that many minutes, and if you're west of Greenwich, add that many minutes. Try the example. AST is 1042, the equation of time is plus 5, and your longitude is 35 degrees east. Pause the video now and calculate UT. MST is AST, 1042, minus EOT, 5 minutes, giving 1037. Longitude times 4 is 140 minutes, or 2 hours 20 minutes. Since we're east, we subtract that amount from MST, giving us UT equals 0817. Working the other way, if we know UT, we can find AST. Take UT and add the equation of time to get AST at Greenwich. Again, multiply your longitude by 4. This time, you add that many minutes if you're east of Greenwich, and subtract it if you're west. For this example, UT is 12.15, EOT is plus 8 minutes, and your longitude is 2 degrees west. Pause the video and find AST. AST at Greenwich is UT, 12.15, plus EOT, 8 minutes, equals 12.23. Longitude times 4 is 8 minutes, and we're west, so we subtract it. 12.23 minus 8 minutes is 12.15. You'll also need to convert from UT to local official time, also called civil time, since that's what non-astronomers use. You can find local official time by taking UT, adding your time zone offset, which could be negative, and adding the amount of daylight saving currently in effect. Both these additions are given in hours. Mauna Kea Observatory is in time zone minus 10, 
and does not observe daylight saving time. If UT is 1820, what should your watch say? Pause the video to figure it out. Local time is UT, or 1820, minus 10 hours, giving us 0820. Working the other way, if you know local official time and want to find UT, you subtract the time zone offset and subtract daylight saving, if any. You're in Bulgaria, time zone plus 2, in the summer with DST plus 1. Your watch says 0108. What is UT? Pause the video now. UT is 0108 minus 2 hours minus 1 hour, giving 2208. Note that this is on a different date. We have to take extra care with our calculations when the date changes during our observations. And finally today, we'll learn how to calculate your longitude using a shadow stick. This is very useful for astronomers, as well as people stranded on a desert island. Just make sure you brought a watch set to UT and your equation of time graph. Use the shadow stick to find local noon, or 12.00 AST. At noon, record the time in UT. Find MST from AST minus the equation of time. Now, calculate the difference between MST and UT in minutes. For every 4 minutes difference between MST and UT, your longitude is 1 degree. If MST is earlier than UT, you are west of Greenwich, and if MST is later than UT, you're east of Greenwich. Last example today. You measure 12.00 AST when your watch, set to UT, shows 16.24. The equation of time for today is minus 4 minutes. What is your longitude? Pause the video now. Find MST, which is AST minus the equation of time. 12.00 minus negative 4 minutes, or 12.04. The difference between MST and UT is 4 hours 20 minutes, or 260 minutes. Your longitude is 260 divided by 4 equals 65 degrees, and since MST is earlier than UT, you are west of Greenwich, 65 degrees west. Here are the summary sheets of the definitions and formulae we've used today. I recommend you print these screens from here or from the linked Google presentation, or make your own notes or flashcards. If you're doing the GCSE astronomy exam, you'll need to learn them, and they'll also make useful reference sheets for observational astronomy. Thank you for watching, goodbye, and have an excellent day.